Shalawan Shabbata. So glad to be back with you and with another video. Some of that pure water. You know, this video evolved so much over these last couple of months, but I knew I had to be patient. You know, carefully research and gather this info, which I will be pres presenting to you. It's been a great journey so far. Dawa da hawa, for sure. I've had to deal with my share of static, of course, and the trolling, the harassment. But it has only made me more eager to prove what I'm presenting and saying. So, with that said, thanks to all the haters. Thanks for all the static. I know what was coming, but mainly, hawa knew what he had in store for me and he has prepared me throughout my life for this. So before I begin, let me just make something very clear. Now, this video has nothing to do with Africans or the Asian, Mongolian descendants that are called Native Americans. We ain't gonna have no hijack in this video. So I'm truly grateful and privileged to bring this to you. I, I truly feel that. So to the Shabbata, to the viewers, my followers and subscribers, I just want to say very humbly, thank you from deep down in my heart. Thank you for the constant support and the kind words. Most of them really good. I appreciate all the comments everybody's left. You know, much blessings, much love, much ahab to all you who are supporting or watching. I hope these videos has been useful to you personally in your journey like they have on mine. This knowledge that we're receiving right from the most high. Oh wow. So do you know who you are now? Do you remember? Hope my videos have helped somewhat, you know, make that clear. But if not, I really wanted to make something special and have something solid for the Shabbata the copper colored tribes of America, the Aborigines, and as well for the hijacks, of course, the liars, the blind, and the ego-driven individuals who just refuse to accept and choose willful ignorance over foundational truth. So with that said, let's begin. Hawa! Hawa! Because however, much America strays away from the ideals of justice. The goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up in the destiny of America. Before the Pilgrim Fathers landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before Jefferson etched across the pages of history the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence, we were here. Before the beautiful words of the Star-Spangled Banner were written, we were here. And for more than two centuries, our forebears labored here without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters in the midst of the most humiliating and oppressive conditions. Get out of a bottomless vitality. So you just heard Dr. Martin Luther King tell you that before the Pilgrim's father landed here, you were here. Our forefathers weren't the Pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. Now, what did he mean by this? What, what exactly did he mean by saying you were here? This was towards the end of his speech that day. And he slipped it right in there, you know, to the people that was listening to him that day. So it's either two things, right? Well, there's only could be one thing. But basically, to people who are still kind of brainwashed, only one thing they could assume is that he's talking about maybe Africans, slaves, that had come over and that were already there. And we're talking about 1620, right? When the pilgrims arrived in 1620, he's saying, you were there. You were already there before 1620. You know, they say the first Negroes that arrived, or African slaves that arrived in America, so-called African slaves, was in 1619 in Virginia. All right, so is he talking about that? Or is he talking about the aboriginals, copper-colored aboriginals, so-called Negroes that were living in New England? 
And we're going to talk about those first Africans from 1619, so-called Africans. We're going we're gonna to show you where they really came from and who they really were a little bit later. So, now in New England, this is what the pilgrims encountered. Now, as you can see from this image, these are clearly so-called Negroes, you know, in this drawing from the 1600s by the book of John Ogilvy, right? And uh, mostly, a lot of people know who this is, and you can Google that, his name, John Ogilvy, and look at the images that he draws of the American Indians, and you'll see they're all copper-colored tribes. Now, it says here, New ne Netherlanders Apparel, it says, Modern New England. Delmarva, Peninsula, Cape Cod, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Connecticut, with small outposts in Pennsylvania and Rhode Island, from the book by John Ogilvy, 1600-1676, issued in 1671, and take a look at their clothes, look at this, you know, look at their clothes, they don't look half naked, you know, well, if you're looking at the one in the back, she's just being free, she's probably comfortable like that, I'm sure she wears clothes sometimes on the top. But you can see the, the male, how uh, he's dressed, right? Looks more like Roman, right? Or Spartan or Greek than how they depict savages, savage Native Americans, right? All right. This right here is uh, Chief Rain in the Face. He's a Wampanoag chief. Can't specify the year where I got the image, but he's uh, from the Wampanoag tribe in Massachusetts and this is uh, Dorcas Honorable it says the last known Native American woman on Nantucket who died in 1855 this is from the Nantucket Historical Association and Nantucket is an island really close to uh, Plymouth let me show you right here as you can see um, where Plymouth is in Nantucket right below right and uh, these are natives from the uh, Narragansett and Wampanoag uh, families uh, they got together to take this picture here and uh, they're part of the Algonquin speaking tribes and uh, they're all over New England you know Massachusetts Rhode Island uh, Long Island New York um, you know, Connecticut Wampanoag as you can see, copper colored, right? This is what the pilgrims were encountering. And this is Serbia G. Mitchell, uh, a Wampanoag Native American. As you can see, who, who does she resemble? This, and let's read right here. It says, uh, figure 17, interior view of the Mitchell home at Becky's Neck, circa 1893. Seated on the left is Serbia. On the far right is Melinda Tiwi Lima, that's another known native from that area. And immediately behind her is Charlotte Wotone Sanuske. In the lower right hand corner there is a partial image of a seated man. This could be their brother Alonso. On the table behind Charlotte is a group of rye grass baskets that they were working on. From the photographer L. B. Shaw, landscape photographer El El Elmwood, Massachusetts. All right. And this is another picture of them, the same three, in their home, outside. So as you can see, um, copper color, right? This is Emma Mitchell, another Wampanoag Native American from Massachusetts. So uh, in reference to the Chinookup tribe, right? Just wanted to show you something. I know you guys know a lot about, um, you know, rap and, you know, you know who Old Dirty Bastard is, right? So, in reference to uh, the Shinnecock tribe, as you see here, uh, now here's a little bit of the uh, ancestral history to Old Dirty Bastard. The drugs, the crime, the poverty. These were tough neighborhoods, but there were also places where his family had been for countless generations. In fact, Dirty could trace his lineage back to a time when there was no New York City, just the wilderness of North America. He was one quarter Shinnecock Indian. Then he started mentioning things that y'all didn't understand. He said he got a grandfather Cuffy, Chief Cuffy. Let me take you to Chief Cuffy. 
him and his brothers, Fred Cuff, you know, they were some wild boys back in the day. My great, great grandfather was an Indian chief. Shinnecock from the Shinnecock Reservation in Long Island, Riverhead. So that's where my mother met my father in Long Island. Dirty just carried his heritage to the to the, the limit, you know. We're Indians. I say, and then he used to say, yeah, we Indians, we sold Manhattan. I said, well, listen, they sold Manhattan for trinkets. So he always said, well, we're going to try to get it back. I said, Rusty, please. You're not getting it back, so we get it. So you heard it, you know, old dirty bastard, you know, his his mom, Shinnecock, his, his grandfather. All right, he, he even sang it in the, in the rap song you just heard there. All right, so you can see there's a lot of history here in New England with copper colored tribes, you know. I'm talking about Chief Coffee. That's my mother's father. Now I'm talking about my grandmother, her father's history. That's Reverend Milliton. Now Reverend Milliton, he had a church, started the first Baptist church. He died at 103. Was never seen now. Always knew what he's talking about. But he was back in slavery time. Back in slavery time. And to hear him speak of what happened, it was, I just, I just couldn't believe it. But he was free and he came up to New York to find a place for my grandmother. This was his area when he came up from the south, all up down here. It's right about here. This is where my grandfather's house was right here. This is Bridge Street. And this is where his house was sitting at in the 1900s. So I got two historic legacies in my family, on my grandmother's side and my grandfather's side. So imagine these two people get together and have children. That's where we come from. That's where Dirty come from. That's where Ray Ray come from. That's where 12 come from. Shitty, Murray, all of down the line. Indian, are you? Like Tonto Indian? Yeah, Shinnecock Indian. Really? You're Shinnecock? Yes. Oh, I didn't know you're Shinnecock. <laughs> you could have fooled me. That's the kind I am. Hey. <laughs> so you should be Big Chief Bastard, not older. <laughs> <laughs> See, his family was here when Columbus landed, huh? Is that right? Yeah. So you are not a black man, you're an Indian? I'm an Indian. No kidding. Yeah. I doubt this is a shock. We are learning more today. Hey, you look totally black. Uh, yeah, I was definitely an old Indian. Wow, definitely. <laughs> so the Indians in the fire water don't get along, you know that. So there you go from his own words. He's a Chinnacock Indian, and you thought he was crazy. And you thought he was just drunk all the time. But he was trying to tell us something, you know. He was ahead of the, the game, you know, ahead by years, you know. Um, so I just wanted to put this out there real quick now. If you've made it this far, well, I'm glad you did, because well, we're going to start showing some scientific historic data 
All right, so we're going to start with scientific anthropology. All right, so let's start. All right, so uh, we're going to start with this article from National Geographic. And it's titled, Most Complete Ice Age Skeleton Helps Solve Mystery of First Americans. Because we want to know who was here first, right? That's the whole argument, right? So it says here, The oldest complete skeleton of its kind ever found, dating to more than 12,000 years ago, is helping solve a mystery about the differences in body types between the first, Ameri the first humans to arrive in the Americas and the later Native American scientists announced Thursday. So they're saying there's differences between people who were aboriginally here in America first and then the difference between those that were here later that are called Native Americans today. The scientists are saying this, right? It says anthropologists have long puzzled over why Native Americans don't look more like their ancient ancestors who migrated into the Americas during the Pleistocene. Those seen the epic that encompassed the last ice age that ended about 12,000 years ago. So anthropologists are clearly telling us that the bones they're finding don't look nothing like the Native Americans of today, and they're puzzled as to why. Why don't they look like that anymore? Right? So let's go down. In a flooded cave in Mexico, divers transported skull for 3D scanning between 12,000 and 13,000 years old. The skull is part of the most complete skeleton of such antiquity yet discovered in the Americas. It says the ancient skulls are larger, their faces are narrower and more forward projecting, and they more closely resemble native, native peoples of Africa, Australia, and the Southern Pacific Rim than they do their supposed American descendants. Alright, so you hear that? So these skulls they're finding, well they, this one especially in, in this cave, 12,000 years old, says that it resembles more uh, native people of Africa and Australia, right? And what do these people look like, right? So-called Negro, right? Then they're supposed American descendants, like the Mongolo Mongoloid uh, peoples that are in the reservations today. They don't look nothing like them, all right? These are National Geographic. So uh, you can continue reading this. It's online. Just Google it. Let me go to something else. So it says here, a, a DNA search for the first Americans links Amazon groups to the indigenous Australians. This is from the Smithsonian.com. It says the new genetic analysis takes aim at the theory that just one founding group settled the Americas. You can see here, uh, this copper colored native, right? All right, so it says Brazil's Surui people, like the man pictured above, share ancestry with indigenous Australians. New evidence suggests. Part of the article where it's talking about this finding. So it says race group had also previously found genetic evidence for a single founding migration. But while sifting through genomes from cultures in Central and South America, Pontus Skoglund, a researcher in Ray's lab, noticed that the Surui and Caritiana people of the Amazon had stronger ties to indigenous groups in Australasia and Australians, New Guineans and Andaman Islanders than to Eurasians. All right? So, Central and South America, right? It says, other analysis haven't looked at Amazonian populations in depth, and genetic samples are hard to come by. So, the Harvard lab teamed up with researchers in Brazil to collect more samples from Amazonian groups to investigate the matter. Together, they scrutinized the genomes of 30 Native American groups in Central and South America, right? 30. Using four statistical strat strategies, they compared the genomes to each other and to those of 197 populations from around the world. Now, listen to this. The signal persisted. Three Amazonian groups, Suri, Caritiana, and Shabante, all had come in more common with Australi Australasians than any group in Siberia. All right? They're not related to Siberians. There you go again. So, let's continue with this. All right, so scientific anthropology, we see that... Um basically correlates with historic data like this uh, 1828 Webster's Dictionary telling us that a native that the American is a native of America originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found here by the Europeans all right so I'm gonna start working with your senses to show you you know what these uh, early explorers were seeing uh, in their records and in the books where they were drawn, the photos they were taken. So over here to the far left is um, an Iroquois chief. In the middle is a Wachita Native American. 
and on the right is basically the book of Magellan's travels to the Strait of uh, Magellan in South America. All of these so-called Negroes cover colored. Now it says here, uh, Life Among the Texas Indians, the WPA Narratives. From uh, this book right here, as you can see. Alright, so it says in this part right here, this book. It says, on August 2nd, 1937, there was a human skeleton discovered deposited in a crevice of limestone rock in Atoka County. This location being within the boundary of the hunting grounds in which the Comanche Indians were permitted to use as their hunting grounds for 90 days. At that time, permission was given a band of Creek Indians was hunting in different locations Pittsburgh County without permission, which caused some trouble between the Choctaw and Creek Indians. In all probability, the Comanche Indians at their usual hunting season camped at this particular place. The human skull and skeleton shows that probably he was a Negro Indian type. He was probably a Negro Indian type and indicated that he was shot with a bow and arrow. The arrowhead being the type that Comanches used. The point of the arrowhead entering the body extends into the backbone and the point of the arrowhead still remains in the backbone of the skeleton. Beads and other ornaments found with the skeleton show the type that a Creek Negro Indian wore in those days. Again, a Negro Creek Indian, the type of clothes and the beads and the ornaments. All right, more correlation. Now let's go to uh, this journal. It's from uh, an anthropological uh, science uh, magazine journal. This came out in 1939. Volume 38 actually spoke of the same thing. It was like uh, the beginning of the talk and, and the next month for volume 39 they continue to talk about it. So it says here, let's see if I can zoom into it. So again, it's man, a monthly record of anthropological science published under the direction of the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain in Ireland. It says here, Negro skeletal remains from Indian sites in the West Indies. Says the recent paper in this journal by Buxton, Trevor, and Julian. They're talking about the previous article I mentioned, right? Volume uh, 47, 1938. Implies that an under undeformed Negroid physical type inhabited the Virgin Islands in pre Columbian times. Not only is this implication contrary to previously accepted findings for the Antillean area, as will be shown later but it also fails to give adequate consideration to the possibility of these skeletal remains representing intrusive Negro burials. The mere presence of skeletons in a sand or shell mount of Indian origin, like in careful stratigraphic records, is not certain evidence of primary association with the accompanying artifacts. Moreover, I venture to say that few physical anthropologists familiar with American Indian skulls would mistake for Indians those illustrated by Buxton, Trevor, and Julian. Indeed, most physical anthropologists would probably be less conservative and say Negro instead of Negroid. Alright, so 100% Negro. He wouldn't even say it's Negro-ish, right? Or Negroid. It's a Negro or copper-colored person, right? In support of the opinion that these authors are describing Negroes, uh, one, I wish to present a similar case from Barbados, British West, West Indies. From correspondence with Mr. E. M. Shillstone of Bridgetown, Barbados, it appears that in August 1933, he commenced to excavate a sandy ridge about 50 yards from high water mark on the shore of Chancery Lane on the southern coast of the island. The ridge proved to be a kitchen, midden containing many objects of Arawak workmanship. Among other things encountered in the site was a skeleton lying on, on its left side at about 20 inches under the surface. Mr. Shilston believed this skeleton to be that of an Arawak Indian and in 1937 presented it as such to the U.S. National Museum. Upon reconstruction of the skull from the many fragments in which it was received in Washington, I felt justified in calling it a Negro for reasons that will appear from the following description. 
Two views of the Barbados coast are shown in Play D 1 and 2. Comparison with the two skulls shown in the paper by Bukeson, Trevor, and Julian indicates that the individual and sex differences are no more than would be expected of the range of variation in a single race. Certainly, however, such negroid features as alveolar, prognatism, broad nose, and low orbits are more pronounced in the case of the Virgin Island skulls. So as you can see, uh, you know, there's information here correlating more findings of skulls. So it's not just in one location, right? So we, so far we get a couple of different sources, right? In the same article, just a little bit ahead in the next page, it says, Without going into further details in connection with physical type, I will call attention to one thing that clearly proves the Barbados specimen to be Negro. The photograph of the normal frontalis shows the upper median inc incisors to be artificially pointed. We have here a well-known type of West African dental mutilation. So this is actually from the first article uh, in the volume, with the volume number 38, before the uh, one we just read, when they were just learning that this was actually starting to look like Negro. They're saying <laughs> so. Right here, they're still arguing. Uh, here, let me just show you. It says Professor Hat over the face seemed to argue against the likelihood of secondary internment after the introduction of Negro slaves in the 17th century. While admitting that the conditions of their final recovery were far from ideal, we are inclined provisionally to accept a pre-Columbian date for the remains as a whole. They're saying that these bones are pre-Columbian, before Columbus, so it's not introduced and it wasn't a mixture of African slaves. Now, uh, let's read on, so it's interesting, it says, It is perhaps not without significance that Sir William Flower, 1895, commented on the Negroid characteristics of two out of a number of Jamaican crania of undoubted Indian origin examined by him. This series was subsequently measured by Dr. Haddon, who mentions the occurrence of considerable variation in the values of the nasal indices in his note on the craniology of the aborigines of Jamaica during 1897. Additional human material from the Virgin Islands may elucidate the problem arising from the present discussion. So it's becoming a problem to them because they're finding all these Negroid uh, skeletons, right? Pre-Columbian all over the, the places, right? So um, that book from Jamaica or that reference, you can find it uh, here if you see it. It says Dordan J.E. 1897 Aboriginal Indian Remains in Jamaica. And Flower Sir William, 1895, on the recent discovered remains of the Aboriginal inhabitants of Jamaica. I did find the books, but as little brief parts, and they're blocked. You have to be a member of a, like a university or something and put in your password. So I wasn't able to get the exact. But if you guys have access to it, there it goes. All right, just do the research. It's there. Now, uh, before we continue, I just wanted to talk about how ancient people, you know, medieval people, colonial people were depicted Americans. As you see, these two here pointing to the map of America. This is from the British Museum uh, website. This is an emblem of America. Uh, this is another personification here of America. America, again, historical drawings. And more. The one on the right is from a museum in Holland. And more depictions here of American indigenous people. The Hispaniola, where Columbus landed, as you can see, he has natives under him, copper colored. This is the natives uh, zoomed in, as you can see, clearly so-called Negroes, right? This is Hernan Cortez in the same painting, just over to the right. And it's zoomed in, you can see... And these are uh, the Indians that Columbus supposedly brought back with him to Europe, to Spain, and introduced to the king and queen. As you can see, these are copper-colored, so-called Negroes. So again, in these old depictions of uh, the Aboriginal Americans, uh, you know, we run into this pattern of them being copper-colored, right, or so-called Negroes. You know, this wasn't because they didn't know or they were guessing it's because this is what they were seeing so uh, before i continued i just wanted to for you to have this perspective you know what these uh, people are encountering on this side of the world i also found this um article right and it says Rihalapa vermela hominid 
morphological affinities of the earliest known American. All right. So let's just read a little bit here. All right. Let's close up. It says several studies concerning the extracontinental morphological affinities of Paleo-Indian skeletons carried out independently in South and North America have indicated that the Americas were first occupied by non mongoloids you hear that non mongoloids that made their way to the new world through the Bering Strait in ancient times because that's the only way they could imagine it the first South Americans show a clear resemblance to modern South Pacific and African populations you hear that while the first North Americans seem to be an unresolved morphological position between modern South Pacific and European in none of these analyses, the first Americans show any resemblance to either Northeast Asians or modern Native Americans, okay? So far, these studies have included affirmed and putative early skeletons thought to date between 8,000 to 10,000 years before the present. In this work, the extracontinental morphological affinities of Paleo-Indian skeleton, well dated between 11,000 and 11,500 years before the present, uh, La Paver Mahomini or Lucia is investigated using as comparative samples Howells Worldwide Modern Series and Hapgoods Old World Late Pleistocene Fossil Hominids The comparison between La Paver Hominid 1 and Howells Series was based on canonical variety analysis including 45 size corrected craniometric variables while the comparison with fossil hominids was based on principal component analysis including 16 size corrected variables. In the first case, Lapa Bermeja fourth hominid one exhibited an indisputed morphological affinity firstly with Africans and secondly with South Pacific populations. You hear that? They were Negro. These uh, skeletons, the anthropological science has concluded that it resembles more Africans and second South Pacific population instead of the actual Native Americans of today, Mongoloid. In the second comparison, the earliest known American skeleton had its close similarities with early Australians in Sukodian, Upper Cave 103 and Tafordalt 18. The results obtained clearly confirmed the idea that the Americas were first colonized by a generalized Homo sapiens population which inhabited East Asia in the late Pleistocene scene before the definition of the classic mongoloid morphology all right and it's not me who's created this this is from science silo lab genetics and molecular biology this is from the genet genetics uh, molecular biology uh, journal volume 22 in sao paulo december of 1999 all right just in case you guys want to go look it up here's the email you can contact them and ask them for yourselves all right, so before we go into the uh, historical accounts of what these early colonists, explorers, settlers, pilgrims, conquistadors uh, saw, described as the characteristics of these uh, aborigines or indigenous people they were encountering, you know, the colors, how they were, their, you know, the complexion, their stature, the body type, and everything. We're going to go over some words that they're going to mention a lot, such as you know copper colored so as we all know if you don't know the color of copper right let's take a look at a few examples right copper you know we know that the penny is made out of copper and the even the the old pennies were even a little bit darker so it does make sense you know when they say copper colored who they're referencing right and um, we just need to use our senses for that they also mention a lot, of course, brown skin. We know as well who is brown skin and what color usually the shades of brown are. We have a reference of as well as uh, Swarti. And Swarti, uh, basically the meaning of Swarti just means, you know, dark skin or black or a dark complexion. Um, they're also the reference of the uh, Aborigines being of cinnamon color, right? We know what that looks like as well, you know, as well as the different shades of cinnamon, as you can see in this uh, cinnamon color palette. 
And of course, you know, we all know the term the red man, right? They used to call the Indians the red man. But when they're talking about red, you know, they're really basically talking almost copper or a brownish red, not red like uh, an apple or red uh, like a red rose, but they're talking about that mahogany, right? Cinnamon, copper color kind of red. And I wanted to read something to you uh, here uh, from New York Times regarding the color Crayola had called Indian red. So, so it says here, chestnut replaces a color Crayola called Indian red. From New York Times, July 27, 1999. After sifting through more than 250,000 suggested names, Crayola has renamed its reddish brown crayon to avoid misunderstandings over the color's origin. The color Indian Red, which Crayola said was based on reddish brown pigment commonly found near India, was dropped because teachers complained students thought it described the skin color of American Indians. So you see how they're trying to like bullshit that <laughs> they're trying to say that it resembles something in India. But we know exactly what they meant when they named this Crayola Indian Red. Look at the color, it's almost brown, right? Continuing says the new name will appear on 15 million crayons each year beginning in September. It is only the third time in the company's 96 year history that a color has been changed. Only the third time. So why is this so controversial and why did they have to change it? They knew eventually you would wake up and notice and put two and two together. Nearly 100,000 people from age 3 to 90 submitted names including 155 people who suggested chestnut. Other popular suggestions included red clay clay red and mars red others rejected names included ginger spice crab claw red old penny there you go old penny and baseball mitt one person even suggested the crayon formerly known as indian red in honor of the rock musician formerly known as prince very funny again so i just wanted to put this into perspective before i start getting into the historical accounts of the physical characteristics of the indigenous by the early settlers explorers conquistadors all right, so let's let's get on with the video. From Carlos Cuervo Marquez, 1858 to 1930, ethnologist, bot botanist, military general, and historian, it says, says the Negro type is seen in the most ancient Mexican sculpture. The Negroes figure frequently in the most remote traditions of some American pueblos. It is to this race doubtlessly belongs the most ancient skeletons, distinct from the Red American race which have been found in various places from Bolivia to Mexico. It is likely that we repeat America was a Negro continent. Again, we repeat, America was a Negro continent. Carlos Cuervo Marquez from the Estudios Arqueológicos y Ethnográficos, Volume 1, Madrid, 1920. So, you know, Another correlation here, you know, everybody, but we always got static telling us you can't believe everything you read on the Internet, right? So the good thing is I was actually able to find this book in, in Spanish and let's read it together. So uh, this is the cover of the book, uh, Estudios Arqueológicos y Ethnográficos. So let's get right into it. All right, so I went to uh, right to page 23, chapter 5, and it says here, Los Negroides in America, or the Negroes in America. All right, so this is the part that I'm going to translate. So take a look at it. So I, what I did is I copy-pasted this and brought it to Google Translate. All right, let's take a look. So it translates to, it says, Several isolated but concordant facts allow us to suppose that before the formation and development of the three great ethnographic groups of which we have just spoken, the Pampas, Andeans and Caribs, a large part of America was occupied by an inferior race of Negroid type. Okay? The conquerors found scattered throughout the New World small tribes that from the first moment were, and continuing, this is what I'm going to translate now, continuing. So again, remember, we ended up with were, so it's, again, it continues, were considered as belonging to the black race. Such were, for example, the Otomi from Mexico, the Snails from Haiti, the Ara Argajos from Cutara, the Arabos from Orinoco, the Porsejis and the Malayas from Brazil, the Manatos, Quito, the Chuanas, 
the Darien, etc. And just to finish up, this is the next part that I'm going to translate right here. So you can take a look at it before I take it to Google Translate. And it says, the skeletons of structure that are very different from those of the American red race, which in several parts of the continent have been found from Bolivia to Mexico, must be referred to this race. They're talking about the negroid uh, skeletons they found. Worthy of attention in this regard are the two skulls of exaggerated prognatism with a lowered forehead, very developed apophyses and strong superciliary arches that in the Sumapaz Mountains found the illustrated professor Dr. Juan de Dios Carasquilla. So they're referring to uh, another type of skulls, right? Negroid skulls being found in Sumapaz, that is Bogota, Colombia, so more correlation, right, of skeletons of Negro type or Australian type, right, copper colored, so-called Negro, all right, and so again, that was from the findings of Carlos Cuervo Marquez, Negroids in America, and you can see here some of the stuff in the book. Now, I want to uh, reference uh, this other book, it's called Crania Americana, a comparative view skulls of various aboriginal nations of North and South America all right so I wanted to uh, kind of belly flop to page 68 and before we continue talking about um, their characteristics and the colors of these tribes uh, this person this author mentioned something very interesting uh, in this part, it says, Mr. Shulcraft mentions beards as common among the Potawamis and alludes to a very old man of that tribe whose long descending gray beard would not disgrace a Nazarite. A Nazarite. So these Potawatomis were uh, upper Mississippi, the greater western uh, Great Lakes, and, you know, Mongoloids, uh, people Asian, they really don't grow beard like that. So look what this guy is saying, which is very interesting and correlating to what we're going to be talking about later. So continuing this page, it says, A copper-colored skin has been assumed by most writers as a characteristic distinction of the Americans, who have hence been called the copper-colored race. All right? Copper-colored race. The investigations of Dr. McCullough satisfactorily prove that this designation is wholly inapplicable to the Americans as a race and that it is more characteristic of some other and very remote nations. Very remote nations. So he's saying that this is unlikely that they're talking about the modern Mongoloid Asians they found, you know, or, or are in the reservations today or in the time they wrote these books, in the 1800s, 1900s, right? And that it's more uh, of a characteristic of a very remote nation or the uh, or true aboriginals, the Negroes that were here from the beginning. Continuous says the error has obviously arisen from the habitual use among many tribes of red paint to a brown skin, which, which occasions a coppery hue. Humboldt declares that the denomination of copper-colored men could never have originated in the equinoctial regions to designate the Americans, and I can further testify that among the individuals of many different tribes that have come under my observation, I have never seen a copper-colored man, says him. We consider, therefore, says Dr. McCullough, that the color of the American Indians in, in general is brown, right? What's the difference? Copper-colored brown, differing in intensity with various tribes according to various localities, but that it is almost impossible to say what that brown color principally resembles. The cinnamon is, in my apprehension, the nearest approach to it, though still too inaccurate for general comparison. So cinnamon, copper colored, very similar, I would say. I fully coincide in opinion with Dr. McCullough and believe with him that no epithet derivable from the color of the skin so correctly designates the Americans collectively as that of the brown race. Again, the brown race, all right? Although the Americans thus possess a pervading and characteristic complexion, their occasional and very remarkable deviations, including all the tints from a decided white to an unequivocally black skin. There you go. Black skin. Alright, so black skin. Alright, copper color, right? This is an 1877 delegation 
as the picture was described to be. This is a map of Peru. You can see the copper colored people there and Tierra de Fuego natives to the right, that's in South America, Argentina. Over to the left is Big Loon, a Blackfeet Indian. Over to the right is a bird rattle, pagan tribe, and in the middle, just another couple color native. Um, here we have a depiction of uh, a map it says Mar de Ethiopia, and it's actually on top of South America, though. So it's referring South America to Ethiopia. Towards the left, you see a tobacco Indian, either in Virginia or in the Caribbean. And of dark skin, as it says uh, many times throughout history, uh, dark skinned people were usually referred to as Ethiopian. And as it says here in Hernan, the history of Hernan de Soto in Florida, I got this from the footnote. It says Ethiopian is a name that anciently was given to dark colored people. All right, so I mean, we already knew that, but there's more correlation, right? And to the left, we have Behi or Beji. In the middle, we have Billy Bowlegs. And on the right, we have a North American Indian from Cal Spell, it says here, 1924. This is a bird on the ground, is his name. As you can see, with his pipe and his staff and his hand. And the clothing has symbols, native symbols, like the cross and everything before it was hijacked. To the left, we have Black Thunder. In the middle, we have Black Owl from Wisconsin. And to the uh, right, we have a copper colored Native American. To the left, Blackfoot Chief. And the right, Geno Smith. Before and after. So, do you remember who you are? Let's continue. The American nations or outlines of a national history of the ancient and modern nations of North and South America says of this wide western hemisphere let us retrace the history of all the nations dwelling here let us recall the memory so they're talking about it the, all the tribes right all the peoples living here it says from the university of california uh, library yeah, this book is from uh, 1836 all right so let's see all right so i just want to belly flop to a couple parts of this book right here in the introduction on page 32 it says Thought it is a positive fact that many ancient nations of the East, such as the Libyans, Moors, Etruscans, Phoenicians, Hindus, etc., had heard of America or knew nearly as much of it as we did of Australia and Polynesia a hundred years ago. And if you've been following the journey, you've been watching my videos and other videos on YouTube from other uh, scholars, you, you, you know, we're relating, we know this is the old world. So, of course, you know, these nations were probably also here and they knew of America, of course. Continuing, it says, It is a certain that America contained anciently, as even now, a crowd of distinct nations and tribes, some of which were quite civilized, perhaps as much as the Spaniards led by Columbus, the others more barbarous, but not entirely savage. There were but few, if any, real savages in America, dwelling in woods without social ties. Most of them were wandering tribes of fishermen or hunters. All right, so now we're going to get to the part that's going to correlate to what we've been uh, learning, right, about the characteristics. It says, there were formerly in America as now tribes of all complexions as elsewhere, yellowish, olive, coppery, tawny, reddened, brown, incarnate or white, and even blackened or negro-like. Again, blackened or negro-like. How much more correlation do we need? Continue says, tall and dar darfish men from 8 to 4 feet in size, called giants and pygmies, men with various frames, skulls, and features of all the sorts found in the Eastern Hemisphere. Continuing it says, the Americans had long before Columbus large cities built of stones, bricks, or wood with walls, ditches, temples, palaces, some of which were of immense size and population. One of them was Otolum, near the Palenque, it was 28 miles long, equal to Thebes, Babylon, and Kinosh in size, and monument. And further down in this book it says, Respecting the chronology of the American annals, it is rather obscure and doubtful, but perhaps not more so than that of all ancient nations except the Chinese. It frequently ascends as far as the floods and even creation. Right? As far as the floods and creation. Are you understanding what they're trying to tell us there? 
So just like the Bible, right? Uh, these people's oral tradition goes all the way back to creation or the flood, right? The flood of Noah or the, in, in the Garden of Eden, right? Creation, when the, uh, Hawa made the heavens and the earth. All right, so let's continue. It says, the most ancient dates are found among the Tolts or Toltecas and Atlantes. Look at that word, Atlantis, Mexicans or Aztecas, the Muyuscas, Onkwins, Linapis, etc. All right, and almost done with this book. Further uh, down or in later chapters of this book, it says here, American anthropography will teach that there were men of all sizes, features, and complexions in this hemisphere before 1492 notwithstanding the false assertions of many writers who take one nation for the whole american group the ushiks the puruais the parias the chongs etc were as white as the spaniards wow as white as the spaniards right it's interesting to know what these tribes were or who, where they came from it says 50 such tribes were found in south america while many tribes of Choco, the Manabis, the Yarudas, and, and etc., were as black as Negroes, right? They were as black as Negroes. All the other shades of brown, tawny, and coppery were scattered everywhere. It says here, there was not a single red man in America unless painted such. Right, so they're basically telling you it's not that you know that tag that they have to the Native American as the red man, you know that wasn't the case. He's clearly telling you they were more coppery brown, you know, tawny, you know, black as Negroes, not red. All right, so let's continue with this uh, video into another source. So another historic account. This is uh, Verrazano's voyage along the Atlantic coast of North America. 1524 and you know the east coast of uh, america what he saw there and the natives that he encountered on this side of the world let's go all right so on page seven of this uh book this uh account of from Gio giovanni Vesaro, it says here regarding the indians some wear certain garlands of feathers or birds they are dark color not much unlike the ethiopians all right so he's saying that they're dark in color, just like in Ethiopian. And in, th in those days, you, we know that Ethiopian was referenced a lot to uh, people of dark skin or dark complexion or people, peoples living uh, in, in lands where it was only uh, people of copper color, like the third Ethiopia or the farthest Ethiopia, right? Uh, Continuous says, and hair black and thick. Who has black and thick hair? Not very long, which they tie together back on their head in the shape of a little tail as for the symmetry of the man they are well proportioned of medium stature and rather exceed us so he's telling them how you know the physical uh, aspects of, of the aborigines he's inhabiting and who does that sound like too and in the very next page on page eight he starts talking about some other natives he encountered in the east coast and on the bottom part of the page eight it says which young man learned of this people that they are thus of dark color like the others so just like the others he saw they are dark colored this other tribe he's talking about the flesh more lustrous of medium stature the face more clear-cut much more delicate of body and other members of much less strength and intelligence so we got another account here uh this guy is called vicente riva palacio from 1832 to 1896 he was a military general politician historian writer and grandson of the first black president of Mexico, Vicente Guerrero, it says here, all right? Did you know Mexico had a black president? <laughs> now, it says, it is undisputable that in very ancient times, the Negroes occupied Mexico. They brought their own religious cults and ideals. And that's from uh, the book Mexico a Través de los Siglos, volume 1, page 63 to 67, Mexico, 1887. And here's the PDF. I was able to find it. Mexico a través de los siglos. Again, uh, here's a cover. Let me show you what I see found here. And look at the Indian. As you can see, copper color, right? So-called Negro. Just like it says in Webster's Dictionary, 1828, American, a native of America, originally applied to the aboriginal, so copper color races found here by the Europeans. 
So again, look at these Indians on this book cover. Copper color. Alright? And this is the book again, Mexico a través de los siglos. With the cover inside the book. When you, once you get to page 63 and through 67, you start uh, reading this part of uh, El Hombre Negro, as it's called here, as how he is the original inhabitant of the Americas. Alright, so let's read some small segments of this uh, book and what he says about the native Mexicans, right? The aborigines. So we're going to translate this part right here first. And it says, As a clear trace of the black race, we have some little heads of Teotihuacan, and we've seen a clear type serpentine mask. Regarding those little heads, we'll say that in the innumerable tumuli from the ruins of that great city are found between different objects. They are made of clay and end in the neck or appendix. According to Mr. Orozco, they put on the mounds to commemorate the race of everybody. And indeed, examining them carefully, it is observed that they are not formed at illibitum. In comparing them, it is noticed that the artificers copied determined people. Among them are some with a flat nose and lips outgoing, which, which, could, all, which could not be applied but to individuals of a black race. So he's saying that these little heads are depicting black people they have black features or copper colored features or so-called negro features it is also noticed in the examination of those little heads that belong to known types while others refer to figures and completely touch strange and different from those registered in the historical times this proves that previously there were towns with unknown customs and diverse races of those of earlier times okay i think it would suffice to venture the claim of the former existence of the black race the finding made of little heads of its kind but for the most part we have as another test the colossal head of Huayapan it was discovered in the 1860s in the hacienda of that name located near San Andres Tuxtla, Tuxtla. that is in one of the most hot near our Gulf Coast he found coincidentally in the field and the curiosity was limited to digging the earth to discover it leaving it in the hole that had been formed Head, it is granite, two yards high and with the corresponding proportions. Your type is clearly Ethiopian, right? So, of, of uh, so-called Negro or Ethiopian is saying here. And his special headdress and the cuneiform incision that he has on his forehead and that he remembers some sacred sign of Asia, all right? So, very ancient. And continuing as it says here, but the parent test of the former existence of the black race in our continent is that still his remains are found in him and others speak to us the primitive chroniclers so they're saying that the remnants of these uh, black tribes are still in America and it says such are the Caracules of Haiti the Californiums of the Caribbean islands the Californiums of the Caribbean islands you hear that Argiajos de Cutara the Aroras six Yararas of the Orinoco the Chaimas of Guiana, the Munujibas, Yoresigis, and Malayas of Brazil, Negritas, Chuanas, or Guanas of the Isthmus of Darien, the Manales of Popoyan, the Guatas and Haras of Sahinos from Honduras, the Estuaries of New California, the Black Indians found by the Spaniards in Louisiana. You heard that right? Black Indians found in Louisiana by the Spaniards. It says and continues, and the Moon Eyed and Albinos discovered in Panama and destroyed others by the Iroquois. So you see all these uh, tribes that uh, he, this chronicler, knows, this historian, that they were Negro or so-called blacks. They were Aboriginal to this side of the world. And uh, just to finish up on this book, uh, it says here later on in later chapters regarding one of their gods, which was called Botan or so-called gods, right? Botan was a priest, it says, and therefore the first government of the Cha Chayes was theocracy. He, he village of the offspring of the Botanes was called Teospica, Teopisca, corruption of Teopisca, which means place of the priest. If we wanted then to suppose for a moment to Botan or to Samna, we would say that they were two black priests that they had brought from the Libya, the new civilization and new cult. So you hear what he's saying? He's saying these two gods are priests and that they're black priests that came from Libya. This we would explain those Ethiopian faced gods with the singular cuneiform sign like the head of Huayapan and the gigantic axe 
It would also give us reason to why the gods were anointed with Ni'u and the priests they painted themselves black. Particularly that had its origin of the southern civilization then to Quetzalcoatl, representing the Nahua priesthood. It was painted white and bearded. This also explains the architecture of the region in which Violet led and found mixed elements of yellow race and black race. The Mexica as souvenir they had a black god. Chichilton, which means the face black. The temple of this god was painted boards and there were many jars of water covered with comales. This water was called Tililtlant, which meant water black. And when a sick child took him to drink from and it, when a chick and a sick child was took him to drink from Tialtin. He had the particular image of this god, who was not painted or sculpted like that of the others. But it was a priest who dressed with the special custom of the deity that he represented. It seems they wanted with this living image means so expressive to the black priest who had introduced the cult and in God had been converted. So it's saying that this person was made into a god. It was he was a priest and he was the one teaching them the you know, the uh, uh, I guess their religious uh, teachings or the, as he calls it here, cult. Now, uh, it's interesting, uh, when they're saying they painted the face black to be like the priest in ancient times, you know, they're, you know the, the later on Native Americans who don't look black, so-called black, they did actually do that, they still do that, they paint sometimes themselves black and try to look like the gods, uh, as it's saying here, alright, so, just wanted to finish up with this book so you can see that even in their mythology or even in their gods or their traditional, their historic priest kings, right, like the Meshi, from the Mexicas, right? We're talking about the same people, right? It was Moshe, priest, King Khan, right? Kukul Khan, which means high law given priest. All right, so I just wanted to read this to corroborate a little bit and show you that they're also referencing their gods as so called Negroes. And continuing, uh, this book is called The History of the American Indians, particularly those na nations adjoining in the Mississippi. East and West, Florida, Georgia, South and North Carolina, and Virginia. This is written by James Adair. All right. So right in the beginning, almost in the very first chapter of this book, uh, it says a history of the American, North American Indians and their customs. Right. It says observations of the color, shapes, temper, and dress of the Indians of America. S and let me zoom in here. Um, it says the Indians are of a copper or red clay color. Again, copper or red clay color, just like Webster's Dictionary. And they delight in everything which they imagine may promote and increase it accordingly. From the book uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything in Your American History Textbooks Got Wrong by James W. Lowen. And it's a good book. We're going to belly flop to page uh, 43 right now. Alright, so I'm going to start in this part where it says Columbus' son Ferdinand. So it says Columbus' son Ferdinand, who accompanied the admiral on his third voyage, reports that people they met or heard about in eastern Honduras are almost black in color. Black in color. Alright. And they say ugly in aspect, probably Africans. Probably Africans, right? In his perspective, because he thinks everybody comes out of Africa. Alright. So, Continuous says the first. Uh, so, Continuous says the first Europeans to reach Panama, Balboa and company reported seeing black slaves in Indian town. Again, black slaves in an Indian town. The Indians said that they had captured them from a nearby black community. Again, nearby black community. What do they mean by that? Oral history from Afro Mexicans contain tales of pre Columbian crossing from West Africa, supposedly, right? According to him. And all then data from diverse sources suggest that the pre-Columbian voyages from West Africa to America were probable. But we're going to read later on, we're going to talk about this, that, you know, it's known that it's four times harder to come from Africa uh, to America than the other way around, from America to Africa. Because there's a current, if we follow it, even without paddles, just by uh, floating or just by following the current, it'll bring you up uh, from the Caribbean up to North America, all the way over to Europe and down to Africa, West Africa. And we're going to read, see this later in another book called Africans and Native Americans by Jack Forbes. All right. 
All right, so before I proceed, I wanted to talk to you about this uh, image right here and where it's from, actually in Mexico. So you can see it's copper colored uh, Native Americans. So uh, if you Google uh, Bonampak murals, you're gonna get this, as you can see all these images from this actual uh, Mayan temple they actually found inside the painting was still preserved and it actually tells you you know how they look like so let's read a little bit about it all right it says here the discovery of the Bonampak murals as you can see it says the classic Maya site of Bonampak in the state of Chiapas Mexico so it's located in Chiapas Mexico is best known for its mural paintings the murals cover the walls of three rooms in the so-called Temple de las Pinturas, or Temple de las Pinturas, Temple of the Paintings, or Structure 1, a small building on the first terrace of Bonampak's Acropolis. All right, so you can do your research on it a little bit more. You'll find some interesting stuff in it. So before I continue with Bonampak, I have this book. It's called An Inquiry into the Distinctive Characteristics of the Aboriginal Race of America by Samuel George Morton. All right, so we're going to go into this book just so we can uh, take a look at what he's saying. So uh, right from the beginning of this book, the author clearly uh, explains to us the, what he's seeing uh, in these regions of the world. It says, it is chiefly my intention to produce a few of the more strikingly characteristic traits of these people to sustain the position that all the American nations, except in the Eskimo, are of one race and that this race is peculiar and distinct from all others. So he's saying that a lot of the tribes are basically almost one except the Siberian Eskimos, right? All right. So it says physical characteristics. It is an adage among travelers that he who has seen one tribe of Indians has seen all. So much do the individuals of this race resemble each other, notwithstanding their immense geographical distribution and those differences of climate which embrace the extremes of heat and cold the half-clawed Fujian, shrinking from his dreary winter, has the same characteristic li lineaments, though in an exaggerated degree, as the Indians of the tropical plains, and these again resemble the tribes which inhabit the region west of Rocky Mountains, those of the Great Valley of the Mississippi, and those again with skirt, which, which skirt the Eskimo on the north. All possess alike the long, lank, black hair, the brown or cinnamon colored skin, again, brown or cinnamon colored skin, the heavy brow, the dull and sleepy eye, the full and compressed lips, okay, again, full and compressed lips, and the salient but dilated nose. nose. And uh, continuing in the very next page, it says here, it cannot be questioned that physical diversities do occur, equally singular and inexplicable, as seen in different shades of color varying from a fair tint to a complexion almost black again from a fair tint to almost black when they mean fair they mean light-skinned like a light-skinned negro right or black person uh, and this too under circumstances in which climate can have little or no influence so also in reference to stature the differences are remarkable in entire tribes which moreover are geographically proximate to each other these facts, however, are mere exceptions to a general rule. Okay, so they're saying this is an exception, though, to a general rule. And do not alter the peculiar physiognomy of the Indian, which is undivitingly characteristic as that of the Negro. All right, so again, he's saying that you cannot doubt that the Indian undivitingly has characteristic of that of the Negro. For whether we see him in the athletic cherub, or Carib, right, athletic again, or the stunned Chima in the dark Californian, again, dark Californian, or the fair Boroa, he is an Indian still and cannot be mistaken for being of any other race. He's not African. He's clearly telling you, even though they have these Negro characteristics and they're clearly, you know, like the dark Californian, athletic Charibs, they are not African or from any other place. They are Indian and cannot be mistaken for being of any other race. All right. And this is one of the murals uh, in this uh, temple, as you can see. Uh, the hue or the color of their skin. This is another mural there. 
and I'm gonna give you a little close-up of this just wanted you to see how it looks like from far away these people uh, own the second or right under the king of Maya they have dreadlocks so here they how they you can see the dreadlocks right coming out of th their hair it's clearly dreadlocks here's a another picture it's more saturation more color so you can distinguish look at the dreadlocks coming out of their head all right and there's another mural so you can see another reference here and as you can see all copper colored native americans this is how the walls look in there in one of the, in the temples all right so you can take a look at a perspective so you can see that you know how more clear can it be these are mayas these are ancient mexicans all right so i just want you to see that before i ended the video you know this is a good time to end it because it's already an hour and 10 minutes into it i think i don't want to saturate you with too much info i want you to meditate on what i've shown you and uh, please tune into the next video because i'm going to continue i have way more correlation evidence and historic uh, data to share with you guys so thank you for being here thank you for taking this journey with me and you know blessings hawaii